Rise of the Exile, Book One of the Shadow of the Tyrant King series by J. D. Matter. Chapter Six Rage and Panic. Principal Phillips' eyes bulged. Fury took over. Lucas did not realize it was possible for the human face to turn that shade of purple. The purple faced principal looked awkward as he ran toward Lucas with tense shoulders and stomping steps. Clearly, he had not ran in many years. He grabbed Lucas by the ear, twisted it, and pulled him along. Lucas was not prepared for the sudden pain and squealed. She's not hurt, screamed Lucas. It's just not another word. Curious faces peeked into the hall from various classrooms. Poor little Merriweather, she looked positively mutilated. It wasn't. Even after that talk we had this very morning, you haul off and do something like this? Unbelievable! Principal Philip continued his tirade as he dragged Lucas down the stairs and to the front entrance. He refused to allow Lucas to speak at length. The principal violently flung open the front door and pushed Lucas outside. Don't you ever set foot near my school again! You're expelled! Wait, I didn't! The door slammed and Lucas was alone. His heart thumped so intensely that he could feel it in his throat, and he felt winded. Though Lucas walked slowly, his trip home was going much too quickly. Random pedestrians stared at him, either because he looked so pitiful, or they wondered why he was not in school. The walk gave Lucas some time to think. Perhaps he could pretend to go to school every day. That was a good idea, he thought. He could hide the whole ordeal from his godparents. He began to think of places he could go every day until school let out. It would work brilliantly, Lucas thought. Lucas, why aren't you in school? The voice was unmistakably Lucas's godfather, Frederick Day. Lucas was too busy staring at the tops of his own feet to notice his godfather's approach. Frederick had a dead deer slung over his shoulder, which made him look menacing. He was dirty. He had blood on him. Real blood. He was rugged. Lucas feared the impending conversation. Lucas hesitated. How could he ease the blow? What diplomatic finesse could he muster? They actually kicked me out of school on the first day. Can you believe that? Alas, the filter between Lucas's brain and mouth malfunctioned at the sight of his intimidating godfather. The dead deer dropped to the ground with a deep thud. Lucas wondered if he would soon join the animal. What? His godfather was added to the long list of people who yelled at Lucas that day. He faithfully explained the entire story as Frederick stared down at him, but Lucas could not say anything to successfully diminish his godfather's scowl, which was troubling. Lucas, I can't believe this! He scooped the deer off the ground and grabbed Lucas by the hand. Lucas winced, for Frederick's hand was encrusted with dirt and blood. As they walked to better ease his burden, Frederick handed Lucas his bow, quiver, and a sack of various scavenged provisions from the woods. They walked a long while without speaking. When they arrived at their little brick house on Maple Street, Frederick burst loudly through the door. Val! Valerie! Get your things together! We're moving back to the swamp! Valerie turned white. Why? What happened? Lucas imagined never seeing his new friends again. He thought about all the fun he had at the end of summer festival, about not being allowed to go back to school, about the slime-covered swamp cottage. His emotions accumulated until he erupted like a little sandy-haired volcano. What are you so afraid of, Frederick? I don't want to live in the swamp anymore. I have friends now. Why do we have to hide? Why? Lucas had never yelled at his godfather before, but he was unusually desperate. Valerie sobbed, and Frederick was furious. Oh, we can't go back! Valerie started shaking. Apparently, some girl made everyone believe that Lucas attacked her, and he was expelled. She'll obviously tell her parents the same story. What are we going to do when her parents contact the authorities? What if they find out who we are? Who cares? Lucas's boldness surprised everyone. Why are you so afraid of the authorities finding out who you are? 
We've been through this. You're too young. You can tell me. You can trust me. Frederick ignored Lucas. They might be coming for us already. Let's just go now. Frederick's desperation was suddenly silenced by a loud knock upon their front door. Lucas's godparents looked like they were going to vomit. Frederick violently tore the bow off Lucas's shoulder and yanked an arrow from his quiver. Lucas fell to the floor unprepared for his godfather's reaction. Frederick knocked an arrow, pulled back with his powerful arm, and aimed at the door. Who's there? demanded Frederick. Um, I... I'm Principal Philip, Lucas's principal, from school. Frederick exhaled loudly and lowered the bow. Valerie scrambled for the door and cracked it open. When she peeked outside, she saw Principal Philip's unmistakably shiny head. He pitifully held his hat in front of his belly with both hands, as if paying respects at a funeral, perhaps Lucas's funeral. Do come in. Valerie tried to sound as unflustered as possible. Oh, thank you, said Philip as Valerie removed his trench coat. I'm very sorry about Lucas's expulsion. I'm afraid it was a bit premature. I'm sure Lucas has explained everything, yes? Well, we heard some girl got red paint on her face and tried to pass it off as blood. That's right, indeed. It was paint, as the nurse quickly discovered. I hurried here as soon as possible to inform you that Lucas's expulsion has been revoked. That's terrific, said Valerie. Furthermore, several students have come forward to attest to Lucas's fine character. It's quite remarkable that such a new student already has a devout following. Principal Philip never mentioned that Lucas punched Justum that morning, for Justum was probably one of the students who attested to his character. Lucas thought, as well as Blake and Gigi. Lucas felt a swell of gratitude for his new friends. Everything was going to be okay. In the weeks to come, Lucas made many new friends, but his closest remained Gigi, Blake, and Justin. Lucas's antics had elevated him to an unprecedented status of popularity for a new student. He was, however, still only a new student. He became content to blend in and become merely one amongst the masses. Meriwether had other plans. She considered the situation to be full-fledged war. Dead squirrels and rotten eggs were no longer avoided, but sought, for they made excellent ammo. Disgusting insects were no longer her enemies, they were opportunities. The purple-haired deviant proved to be such a tactical mastermind that the boys often did not realize that she was their assailant. She was thus reduced to leaving behind a signature, a fancy M, wherever she struck, so the credit would be hers. When the boys' desks were vandalized, there was a fancy M carved into the wood. At lunchtime, when the boys found dead bugs in their food, the bugs were arranged to form a fancy M. It was obvious to everyone she was making an example of those rotten boys. Sometimes the boys attempted to retaliate. Unfortunately, they lacked sufficient malevolence and their attempts were laughably dim-witted. Meriwether was now sensitive to anything unusual and anticipated every trap the boys had set for her. Unbeknownst to the boys, jealousy was Meriwether's weakness. It would be quite upsetting for her should Lucas gain any more popularity among the student body. Unfortunately for Meriwether, her pranks would soon cease to be the talk of the school. Sadly for her, something was about to happen that would propel Lucas to iconic status. Chapter 7. A Shocking Occurrence The red and gold of fall yielded to the blue and white of winter. Colorful carpets of leaves were soon blanketed with pristine snow. Sharp winds became less forgiving and the warmth of indoors much more inviting. West Woodland Middle School had warm, glowing windows, orange against the dark gray atmosphere. 
Students were cozy within, diligently working and dreading the cold walk home. Rumors of the war between Lucas and Merriweather eventually yielded to rumors about the witch. Talk of the witch was prevalent throughout every school year, yet the gossip's intensity always fluctuated. As snowfalls became more intense, students were more likely to stay indoors and socialize, thus the witch rumors quickly ran rampant once again. Lucas was not aware of the witch until that winter. According to the rumors, she lived on one of the highest hills in Crete. Her name was Rook, apparently, for she lived in a decadent mansion called the Rook Estate, which was on a high hill in the countryside south of Devonstone. There was a new tale every day about how the witch ensnared some unfortunate child. Such tales did not concern adults, however, for the witch was gossiped about throughout many generations of students. From an adult's perspective, it was an old tradition, but to the students, it was exciting and taboo. Early one day, Gigi inadvertently sparked a discussion about Rook in history class. Professor, how exactly is magic done? Can anyone do it? I have yet to find a reliable book on the subject. Well, Geraticus, I'm not very certain about how to answer that. I have personally never seen magic done, not real magic anyway, but... There were many people throughout history who have claimed to witness great feats of magic. In the past, there have been famous mages, sorcerers, conjurers, and witches of all sorts. Some people say there are Varoxians who can do incredible magic. As you know, the Tyrant King supposedly had extraordinary magical abilities. Mr. Clovenhoof noticed the class stirring. So there really are Varoxians? Gigi sounded unusually high-pitched, almost comical, for he was nervous that other students might criticize him for believing in Varoxians. Never mind about that, interrupted a young, wide-eyed student named Deary Thomas. Are there really witches? Like old lady Rook? She a witch? Deary, I doubt it, said Mr. Clovenhoof. Children like to exaggerate about her. They've been doing it since long before you were born. Actually, I recall when your mother was in my class long, long ago. Don't tell her I said that. And she claimed that Rook briefly turned her into a skunk. The class laughed. My mom? Really? She never told me that. That's because I'm sure it never really happened. Why not? You just said witches are real. I never said Mrs. Rook is a witch. If she isn't, then why would people say it? I think she might be one. Me too, someone else added. Yeah, she is. The effect cascaded throughout the class. Then Merriweather spoke. She should be thrown in prison and left to rot. Her harsh comment quieted the class. Who do you think turned my hair purple? Merriweather, your hair is not purple. When Mr. Kolovenhoof said that, the entire class stared oddly at him. Sir, no offense, but I think you might be colorblind, said Blake. Her hair is the purplest thing I ever seen. A horrifically shrill scream suddenly sliced through the silence. It came from the hall and echoed through the classrooms. Mr. Kolovenhoof jolted from his chair, causing it to tip over. He darted into the hall to investigate. A couple of brave students followed at first, but soon the whole class stampeded out. The building shook as many other classrooms emptied into the hall. It was Mrs. Leafton. A crowd formed around the startled art teacher. She stood still, staring and pointing with one hand, while the other covered her gaping mouth. All heads turned in a single orchestrated-looking movement to the wall where she was pointing. The trees are moving, she screamed. The trees are moving! Student artwork littered the floor. Apparently, Mrs. Leafton had been in the midst of decorating the hall with her students' various artworks. She had managed to hang Lucas's painting of the forest before it happened. As she stood there, pointing at the painting... Similar screams erupted from the crowd. The trees in the painting 
swayed gently to and fro as if in a breeze. They could hear the leaves rustling just as clear as if the painting were an open window. A few leaves blew out of the painting, twirling and drifting until they came to rest upon the hallway floor. Several brave people scooped them up and examined them. The leaves were real. The school flooded with gasps and whispers. Several things happened during the next few days. Lucas was thoroughly questioned by his teachers and Principal Philip about the painting, but Lucas had no answers for them. He was as baffled as they were. A popular theory soon developed throughout the students. Mrs. Rook made the trees move. She must have known they were discussing her. Perhaps she was warning them of her power. Gigi liked to point out, however, that students had been talking about her for years without any other signs or warnings. That bit of logic inadvertently gave rise to another popular theory. Lucas himself made it happen and was lying about it. The new rumors about Lucas led to reactions of either fear or reverence. Some students ran away when they saw Lucas come around a corner. Others dropped to one knee and bowed their heads. To this, Lucas said things like, No, please, get up. Or, Honestly, I didn't do it. Or, You don't have to bow to me. His humility became so tiresome that he eventually gave in. Blake, Gigi, and Justin fell into fits of hysteria when Lucas told bowing students, Go with peace, my child. Or, You are worthy, my son. Or, You are hereby knighted by order of Lucas the Great. The school was soon upheaved in a new round of commotion. During one seemingly ordinary day, a torrent of water flooded into the classrooms from beneath the doors, shattering any illusions of normalcy and undoing any complacency gained since the last disturbance. Teachers and students alike sloshed through the water and filed into the halls once again. Lucas cringed when he saw what had caused the flood. His painting. A potent rainstorm was occurring in Lucas's painting. Water poured from the canvas, down the wall, flooded the halls, and turned the stairs into waterfalls. Lucas, feeling responsible, quickly grabbed the painting off the wall, which soaked him. He sloshed into the boys' bathroom and propped the painting over a sink. He worried that little bolts of lightning would reach out for him. The painting remained in its new home over the sink during the next few days. That inadvertently led to several desperate situations and accidents by students who refused to enter the bathroom. The painting finally ended up in the basement over a drain. Hardly befitting a great work of art, Lucas thought. Chapter 8. The Dreaded Witch For Lucas, everything spiraled out of control. The students began to turn against him, for he failed to accomplish any more magic. He attempted more paintings, but Mrs. Leafton strongly encouraged him to paint subjects like kittens, balloons, or a vase full of flowers. His kittens, though realistic, did not frolic. He pushed a needle into his painting of balloons, half the class covered their ears, but there was only anticlimactic silence and a hole in the canvas, and his painting of a vase full of flowers had no fragrance. Lucas, it seemed, was a fraud. Rook was the magic source, everyone concluded. Smoky winter ice thawed and spring's vibrant greens began to appear again. Lucas endured the entire winter without coming any closer to a solution. Gigi proved to be a valuable friend, for he constantly researched the phenomenon. He read whatever he could find on magic and performed several experiments on the forest painting, but to no avail. Why were those little painted trees real? What caused it? There had to be an explanation. Gigi was determined to discover it. Meanwhile, the anti-Lucas, pro-Rook movement grew bolder every day. 
A disturbingly large number of students became upset with Lucas for taking credit for what they believed was clearly Mrs. Rook's doing. Derry Thomas even started a new club called The Humble Order of the Witch, T-H-O-W. They had weekly meetings where they speculated about Rook's intentions. On Lucas's desk, next to the fancy M, there was a bit of new graffiti. T-H-O-W shall never take credit for the witch's work. One sunny Friday morning after history class, Lucas reached his breaking point. I want to find out, once and for all, if that Rook woman really is a witch, Lucas said to Gigi, his closest ally. Well, given your current situation, that seems logical. How would you do that exactly? Well... I can start by asking her. That's audacious. Then Blake joined the discussion. Who cares if it's audacious? Let's do it. Now wait a minute. Justin's voice came from nowhere and everyone jumped for they didn't realize he was standing amongst them. I've been hearing some pretty scary things about this witch lately. Oh, come on, said Lucas. You don't actually believe any of those stories, do you? You think she won't turn you into a skunk? asked Justin. That won't do, said Blake. My mom won't let me have any pets, especially stinky ones. Maybe she'll turn you into a toothbrush and rub your face all over her black teeth, said Gigi. Or she'll just eat you. I hear she eats people, said Justin. They saw Merriweather approach, which silenced their conversation. She looked misleadingly innocent with big blue eyes and her slightly curly purple hair bouncing along. How such a little girl could cause so much dread was beyond Lucas's comprehension. Yes, yes, that's right, Timothy. Merriweather sounded like any other sweet little girl, but her words were not of little girl persuasion. She eats your arms and legs like drumsticks, but keeps you alive so you can watch her do it. Then she turns you into a wind chime by hanging you upside down with a bunch of other armless, legless children, and you just sort of thud around against each other in the wind for the rest of your life. Yes, she's quite morbid. The four boys stared at each other for a quiet moment, picturing her ghastly scenario. Lucas suddenly burst into exaggerated, deliberately loud laughter. No, said Lucas. She'll snap her fingers, and all of a sudden, your whole skeleton will disappear, and you'll flop to the floor, all flat and limp like a pile of blubber. Then she'll flatten you out like a pancake and use you as a towel to dry off the pus oozing from her every pore. Lucas's scathing speech was hardly serious. Regardless, the others gave him looks of disgust. Don't make fun of me, Merriweather crossed her arms. If you even set one foot on her lawn, well, let's just say that I warned you. She briskly marched away as quickly as she came. No, Lucas walked and talked like some kind of goofy monster. She'll come in the night, snatching babies from their cribs. The sky will fall. The seas will boil. The world will become a wasteland. If only we kept off her lawn. He dropped to his knees. Merriweather looked over her shoulder and squinted at him. Such hatred looked so unnatural on her pretty little face. She twirled her purple hair with her fingers as if to say, Look what she did to me. Lucas successfully trivialized Rook. After all, if Lucas did not fear her, why should anyone else? He was happy to hear that all his friends were going to accompany him to Rook's estate. If she really was a witch, however unlikely, at least they would have strength in numbers. Chapter 9. Merryweather's Sanctuary Spring should have been joyous, but instead was long and torturous. Eventually, Lucas was widely accepted as a phony. Word spread of his intention to confront Mrs. Rook. No one believed he would do it, especially members of THOW. Lucas believed, however, that it was his only chance of redemption. 
He finally got his chance at the beginning of summer when the school year was over and they were free to do as they pleased. Lucas, Gigi, Blake, and Justin walked south through Devon Stone, which was like a brick maze. When they reached the city's margin, an endless sea of rolling green hills was before them. Puffy cumuli drifted slowly across the horizon, blindingly white over the contrasting green vista. The brilliant noon sun shone warmly upon them, but was perfectly offset by a cool breeze. Scattered thickets dotted the countryside. As wind rustled the leaves, it sounded like the surf of a boundless ocean. Their world was peaceful and serene. Yet the four boys grew nervous as they delved into the wide land that brought them closer to the dreaded Rook estate. They trudged into a small valley where they could no longer see the great expanse. Water cascading over rocks in a brook faintly resounded. There was a thick row of sloping trees which sheltered the Mandalay Creek. Through many eons, the once commanding Mandalay was reduced to a trickle of its former self. Long ago, it would have been a formidable obstacle, but instead merely became a welcome diversion. The boys could drink, relax, and possibly forget about Rook and the whole ridiculous quest. They weren't prepared for the ambush. They walked quietly toward the creek, swishing through the tall grass. A smooth, white river rock flew from the darkness of the trees. Gigi saw it first as it sailed toward them. He dropped to the ground. Blake, oblivious, stared at Gigi's odd behavior before the rock slammed into his face, thudding substantially. Blake recoiled and shielded his head with his forearm until he realized what hit him. I'm gonna kill that purple-headed booby, Blake shouted through clenched teeth. The boys sprinted toward the thicket with coordination rivaled only by trained militia. They trampled into the woods like a stampeding herd of cattle. More rocks pelted them from high above. There were too many rocks for just one little girl. She must have had confederates. The tree's canopy enveloped them in an eerie green darkness, which made it difficult to spot the devious little snipers. A flash of purple hair gave away her position. The boys converged at the base of a thick trunk. She knew she was caught. Get out of my woods, Merriweather bellowed from atop her high perch. She sat on a branch and dangled her feet as carelessly as if she were on a park bench. You completely mad, said Blake. These ain't your woods. He pounded his boulder-like fist threateningly into his hand. Oh, yes, they are, another little girl's voice sounded. They scanned the trees and spotted Merriweather's best friend, Wendy Windmill. Look over there, Lucas pointed at Wendy. It's square. Don't you ever call me that. Wendy despised Lucas ever since he managed to get everyone at school to call her square. At first, he called her Double W, which evolved into W squared, which eventually became square. Lucas felt he was being kind. After all, a name like Wendy Windmill had potential for far crueler jokes. Merriweather regained their attention when she kicked down a thick rope, which was tied to a substantial branch. It dangled enticingly before the boys. Why should I be afraid of you, tubby? Merriweather glared at Blake. I bet your fat ass couldn't even get up here. Blake immediately bullied his way to the rope and grabbed it. He vigorously jerked his way upward. Suddenly, there was a sickening crack. The branch should have been able to contend with his weight, but it broke nonetheless. Blake, the rope, and the branch crashed violently. A musky debris cloud engulfed them. Blake hacked as the girls roared with laughter. Merriweather's wry smile glinted when she retrieved something that was hidden behind her back. A hand saw. It dawned on them simultaneously. She had pre-cut the branch. Her ambush was well conceived, for she anticipated all contingencies. Boys, she shook her head. So dumb. The boys unburied Blake from the tangled mass of branches. Blake stood dumbfounded as the others dusted dirt and leaves off him. You gotta come down sometime, 
Blake continued his tirade, staring menacingly up at Merriweather. We're gonna wait right here till you do. You're a coward, said Merriweather. What? said Lucas. You daft? We ain't the ones up in a tree like a stinking monkey. You'd rather face me, a little girl, than Rook. Everyone knows you four were supposed to find out if she's really a witch once and for all. Remember? You've been bragging about it enough. Now that it comes time to do it, you just want to wait around all day so you can pick on a little girl. Lucas noticed that she only acted like a little girl when it suited her, when she was in trouble. He pictured her as a vile, cave-dwelling creature wearing a little girl suit. Indeed, he thought, that was more accurate. She's got a point, Gigi interjected and was scrutinized with wide eyes, raised brows, and gaping mouths. Well, she does. What if we did go back without even having set foot on Rook's estate? We'd be branded as cowards for the rest of our lives. Lucas knew that Gigi did not care about being branded a coward. More likely, it was Gigi's obsession with magic that compelled him, Lucas knew. That reminded Lucas why they were really going to see Mrs. Rook, his remarkable painting. He had a renewed urge to discover if it was Rook's doing or his own. You're right, Gigi, Lucas said at last. This isn't our mission. The girls laughed. He thinks he's on a mission. Merriweather barely managed to sputter through her laugh. Come on, we don't have time for them today, said Lucas as the boys followed him out of the thicket. But I will have my revenge one day. Mark my words. As he spoke, with the most dramatic flourish he could muster, he turned, pointed at her, and then said in his most commanding tone, The repercussions will be concussions. That was the single most comical thing Merriweather ever saw or heard. Her laughter echoed and tears streamed down her cheeks. Lucas felt ridiculous. But he could hardly suppress his own smile. Chapter 10. The Bone Horde They felt the coming storm's chill before they actually saw it. The landscape became more animated as clouds drifted over the grasses. A wispy rain cloud was already watering the woodlands to the west. The sun hid behind that cloud, lining it with brilliance, and a ghostly rainbow materialized. Darker clouds rumbled to the north. The atmosphere seemed like the fronts of an ethereal, invading army surrounding them. Besides their footfalls and hints of thunder, There was nearly total silence. Rook's high hill was in view. They were a respectable distance away, yet the Rook estate was still a commanding presence upon the countryside. It was a foreboding monument to decadence, framed by the turbulent sky. There it is, said Justum. There's no turning back now. Having second thoughts? asked Blake. Not at all. I bet she's got great loot in that place. Justin, we're not here to rob the lady, said Lucas. Course not, just thinking out loud. Justin's smile gleamed suspiciously. They slowly trekked up the hill, struggling as if climbing a long stairway two steps at a time. The new height was surprising and revealing. The Mandalay Valley's close proximity made them feel even higher. It was the farthest expanse they ever saw. Behind them, Devonstone looked like a tiny, anomalous formation of hazy geometric shapes. The tall, wild grass stopped at a perfect line, yielding to a finely manicured lawn's margin. Each blade of grass was the same length, standing at attention like a vast little green army. They hesitated before stepping on the lawn, remembering Merriweather's warning. When they treaded upon the lawn, a little goldfinch greeted them. The little bird acted unnaturally, flying circles around them. It looked like a darting flash of blurry yellow until it finally landed directly in their path. The bird stared oddly at the boys. Its head did not tilt and jerk the way other birds did. Lucas thought he saw the bird shake its head at him while chirping the words, Don't take another step. 
He dismissed the request as his overactive imagination. After all, the other boys did not seem to notice it. Lucas led the way as they continued their march to the mansion. The little yellow century fluttered toward the estate. The marble building, starkly white upon the green hill, was surrounded by a veranda with a high ceiling supported at regular intervals by giant white columns. They stepped upon the shiny floor and their footfalls echoed. They walked toward the entrance, where there were twenty-foot-high double doors with intricately carved cryptic runes. The doors were flanked by epic marble statues of muscular warriors struggling with grotesque beasts. The beasts looked like they were winning. A small arching stone bridge carried them over a central fountain. Water spewed and flowed around them, and a delicate mist cooled their faces. Lucas grasped the door knocker, a bronze dragon head with a ring in its mouth. He thudded it against the heavy door. It echoed ominously. There was no answer. Lucas knocked again. Nothing happened. The boys collectively sighed. Blake and Gigi looked highly relieved. Their relief came too soon, however, for the first of many unnerving events began to occur. Where's Justin? They looked around frantically. Justin was gone. I can't believe it said Blake. He chickened out on us. Damned if he ain't on his way back to Devonstone. Blake laughed. His expression was half amazed, half amused. No, he's not, Lucas said while scanning the countryside. We'd be able to spot him from up here. An elusive intuition told Lucas that Justin was still nearby. Justin, where are you? Lucas shouted as quietly as he could, a loud whisper. I, 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 I do, 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 do not like this, said Gigi. What if sh- she's toying with us, p- picking us off one by one? They walked to the perimeter of the building, looking for Justin and calling his name in whispering shouts. They were cautiously quiet, cognizant that they were trespassing. They crept toward a jungle-like garden at the rear of the property. The boys eased down a curving stairway which led from the open, pristine structure into the twisted vegetation. There was no sign of Justin. A sweet smell filled the air before it happened. Mmm, smells like someone's baking pastries or something, said Blake. Yeah, yeah, it's like nothing I've ever... The boys were euphorically dazed. Little roots suddenly shot out of the dirt and wrapped around the boys' feet. They jumped as if awakened from a realistic dream. Gigi yelped in horror, for he alone knew what they were. When Lucas pulled his left foot free, his right foot became ensnared, and vice versa. It was maddening. The tendrils looked like headless snakes as they flailed and grasped. Soon, their struggle was nullified. The roots successfully bound the boy's feet to the ground. What is this? Help! shouted Lucas. Then, Mrs. Rook answered him. It's only a juvenile, just like you, she said while approaching through a curtain of vines. Her voice was a witch-like cackle. Exactly what they expected, which was disconcerting. Gigi was especially disturbed to see that her teeth were, in fact, quite black. Her bulbous body was precariously supported by stick-like legs. Gelatinous flab jiggled as she bounded for the incapacitated boys. She was armed with a broom and ready to wield it like a warrior. Gigi began to think that she was too much like what they expected, almost as if someone read their minds found a stereotypical witch, and then took that form. Witches of history, Gigi knew, could look like anybody. It's called a bone hoard, said Mrs. Rook. I planted it there to protect my garden from little bastards like you. In the summer to come, it will grow big enough to swallow you whole. We weren't trying to do anything wrong, said Lucas. We just wanted to meet you. I I, I wanted to ask you something, that's all. 
Rook's face contorted into a wrinkly scowl of concentration. Lucas felt as though she was in his mind, rummaging through the dusty file cabinets that were his memories. She seemed intrigued. Please, help free us, Lucas grunted as he struggled fruitlessly against the roots. Tell me what you wanted to ask me first, said Mrs. Rook. Um, ma'am, we were just wondering if, uh, if, if you really are a witch. Lucas's statement caused Gigi and Blake to cringe and look away, as if they were merely innocent bystanders. Rook's scowl became even deeper. Am I a what? Never mind. Crack! The broom's shaft broke upon the top of Lucas's head. Look what you did to my broom, you hard-headed fool! Blake's temper nullified his fear, and he struggled to get at her. Well, it wouldn't have broke if you didn't knock him on the head with it, you batty broad. Mrs. Rook pointed her gnarled finger at Blake. His shouting sounded normal at first, but became squeaky. The massive boy steadily shrunk. His arms and legs seemed to retract into his body. His face sprouted a little snout. Coarse black hair shot out of his skin. A strip of white hair grew out of his back. Blake became a very plump skunk. No, please stop, cried Lucas. With a wave of her hand, Lucas's hair turned bright green. Gigi's hair turned pink. Mrs. Rook laughed uncontrollably. Every frightened expression seemed to amuse her even more. The situation became deadly. Now that Blake was merely a skunk, the bone horde could contend with his smaller size. Blake squealed and whined as the roots pulled him under the soil. Only his little head remained above ground, but that too would soon be under. Enough! screamed Lucas. If this thing pulls him under, you'll be a murderer! Turn him back now! Lucas struggled to reach Blake, but the roots firmly held him. Mrs. Rook noticed a subtle quality about Lucas during his desperation. It would have gone unnoticed to the untrained eye, and it seemed to even take her a while, but she definitely saw it. Lucas was special. Who are you, boy? He'll die. Change him back, please. I'm begging you. Who are you? He spoke each word between heavy breaths. Lucas! Archer! With another wave of her hand, Blake grew back into a massive boy, but not before letting out a stifling foul odor. He gasped as he crawled out of the dirt, but was not injured. Lucas and Gigi's hair returned to normal. Gigi was dumbfounded. He finally saw magic. Lucas Archer? Archer, did you say? Yes, she stared at him. Lucas felt her probe into his mind, searching. He tried to think of anything except his godparents. He did not want that evil woman to discover them. Tell me, boy, why did you really come here? I know it wasn't to ridicule me. I, I meant no offense. Indeed, you are naive. You had another query, I see. Something happened at school. Something remarkable. And you wanted to discover if I did it. Lucas felt completely naked and vulnerable. She could read his mind. I yes, that's right. I did nothing, boy. You did. I can't quite see it, though. Tell me, boy, what did you do? I made a painting of the forest, and it, it, it came to life. Mrs. Rook stumbled backward and looked immensely frightened of Lucas. You did? Yes, I see it now. You did? She slapped her hand over her open mouth. Tell me, who are your parents? No, wait. They're deceased. Yes. Ah, I see it now. I know who your father was. No, not your pitiful godfather. Your real father. 
She stared into Lucas's eyes and snickered. You have no idea who you are. Mrs. Rook knelt and then stroked the soil as if she were petting a cat. The bone horde's roots released the boys. The tendrils slithered back into the dank depths from which they came. Your father's renown was great. Indeed, your sons will be even greater. Protect them, lest they fall into the wrong hands. The wrong talons, actually. I shall allow you to leave. Now, get out of my sights before I change my mind. Lucas, Gigi, and Blake spun around and tried to sprint away. Panic came again as the bone horde's loosened soil caused them to stumble. The unstable ground's hindrance forced them to jostle along at an agonizingly slow pace before reaching solid ground again. When they reached the open lawn, their speed made the world become a blur. All three of them lost their footing again at the hill's steep, sloping edge. They tumbled down, sky and ground swapped places over and over. They slid to a halt halfway down. Breathing was difficult as they panted vigorously. Grass and dirt caked their clothes. Blake still had a vile stench. There was a calm moment before a light rain came pattering. The three of them, simultaneously, had a sickening realization. Justin!